Welcome to another episode of uh, Tools of the Humans. Today's guest and uh, co-host is Russell Hemmings. Russ is a giant. His spectrum of knowledge and expertise is immense, and when it comes to confrontation, his voice is the mean to achieve amazing results with the people and for the people who work with him. Russell is a behavioralist, an author, and a life coach. This is Tools of the Humans. I am TC, and I'll co-host the show with Russell Hemmings. Welcome to the show, Russell. It's an honor to have you here and um, really ready to dive into this journey, into the journey, which is to uncover the tools of the people, the tools of the people that are facing daily challenges. How are you? Mm -hmm. How was your day so far? I mean, we already talked before, but I'm going to ask it directly now. (laughs) It's a long day. I I start early. Uh, It's intense. It's exciting. I never know who's going to walk through my door with uh, the problems that they have. But, you know, that's what I enjoy. I like to be put under pressure and in the deep end. So uh, honestly, I'd like to say, yeah, I feel fresh. and uh, But yeah, it's been a long day and it's been challenging. And I wouldn't have it any other way. I love it. Yeah. As, I, as I said in the introduction, uh, you are a giant. You have been in. Uh, you have been a pro in this field for a long time with recognition all around the world. So I had in mind an agenda to uh, to do a few episodes with you on specific topics. But then the last week we met online. We tried to figure out some tech uh, mm-hmm. stuff, uh, a bit about microphones and lights and stuff like this. And then mm-hmm. it came down to know us much better. And rehearse some of the questions uh, and tools which could come up during uh, during the show. Sure. And uh, I realized that probably only two or three episodes were on enough. So I said, "Okay, let's start." And you know, your knowledge is so vast that we made a promise: if we digress from what is the question, then we're going to make an episode on that one. Okay, so it's going to be a journey in the journey in the journey. So. Listeners can read about you in your uh, homepage, ralsosemmings.com, uh, but they won't find how you embarked on, on your path, on this journey. Tell us a little bit yeah. Yeah, uh, how sure. you started. Yeah, and thanks for the intro. That's very kind of you. Um, well, it all started, I, I was working in finance. I've always been someone that... Um, has to whatever i'm doing i have to pour my soul into it so uh some people would say you're a workaholic but um i like to say passionate so i was on a conference and i was in van oh no i was in whistler ski resort top of a mountain in in canada on the first day and i was on a a cross trainer and I was reading a magazine because I always find exercise boring. So I have to read something or watch something. And so I'm going 10 to the dozen on this uh, cross trainer and the magazine ends. So I think, oh, I'll go and get another magazine. I stepped off to get another magazine, which is foolish. I should have cooled down. Um, and I got back on the machine again and I collapsed and I couldn't get my breath. Heart was pounding, uh, hyperventilating scared the living daylights out of the uh the trainer you know these personal trainers that sort of run these gyms and he came rushing over and I'm on the floor and I can't get my breath and uh, I said you know I've got all this like my heart it's not it's pounding he said uh you better call an ambulance and I was like oh dear you know next thing ambulance comes I'm on a stretcher they're putting me in the elevator and they're stopping people this this hotel's full of people that work with me so the the doors of the elevator are opening and they're not letting them yeah, in too, they, yeah. i can hear i can hear hear people say that's russell hemmings on the stretcher and then i it opens at the ground floor and i'm carried out um on a stretcher looking at the chandelier in this beautiful hotel which i've only been in for a few hours just landed and uh, put in an ambulance. I honestly don't remember um, the journey from the top of Whistler to Vancouver Hospital. I just, it's a blur, but I just remember thinking, I don't want to die in Canada. I convinced myself I was dying. So um, 
I arrived, they put me in a bed, they, and then they put me on one of these machines. Uh, and I didn't really understand what was going on, but I could hear this beep, beep noise. And I remember the movies, seeing these people with the, you know, the pads where they, they, they put Life them on saver, someone's yeah. chest, they go, stand clear, boom. <laughs> and I, 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 ready. This, I thought they were charging up the uh, machine for someone that's having a heart attack. So that scared me. And so I'm breaking into sweat and I'm preparing to die. And uh, what happened was they, it was a machine. It wasn't what I thought it was. It was a machine PCG, yeah. just to check my heart, to just put on so they got a good reading. Uh, so I worked that out later on. And then the doctor came in with a clipboard. Uh, ironically, he was from England for some reason. He must have been working out there. And he said, uh, Mr. Hemmings, I said, yeah. He said, so you're fine. You can get out of bed. I could have I could have died from that comment. I, I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. So I did both. And I said, are you serious? There's nothing wrong with my heart. He says, no, you're fine. You're stressed. You're probably overworking. You need to get out while you're here and get on a lake with a paddle and start, you know, canoeing. And I was in shock. So I, I don't remember the journey back to the hotel either. I was just in shock. My partner at the time said, there's a dinner dance. You've got to get ready for this evening. I said, I can't go out. I don't want to face anybody. Uh, long story short, I spent the whole of this conference, a few, three or four days in my room, uh, traumatized. I flew home. That was a nightmare. I, was, I didn't have a fear of flying, but I, on the flight, I was having panic attacks. And I got back to my home and I thought everything will be all right. And it wasn't. They just kept coming two or three a day, these massive, intense panic attacks. So I booked in with my doctor who sat me down. I think I was in there about 20 minutes. He said, oh, you, you're having panic attacks and anxiety. I'll prescribe you some drugs. And uh, he didn't explain anything to me. And I went home and read the instructions on the packet and started to take this medicine and uh, I think my mind was thinking and thinking about you know what are the effects of these medicines and that so I stopped taking those and these panic attacks didn't go away they kept coming every day you know and I'd wake up in the morning and the first thought instead of jumping out of bed like I'd normally do and you know I'll go and get a coffee it was like will I be okay today and that was the thought of the day. Am I going to be okay? And as soon as I thought, am I going to be okay? My heart would start racing. So I spent 18 months trying, I think it's my own stubbornness, really, trying to work out what was going on. And I couldn't work it out. I was just getting deeper into my thoughts I remember walking across a park opposite my home with a friend and I said, I, I, I can't explain it. It's like, I said, it's like someone's done something to my brain and even the visual imagery of the landscape of all the trees, that it's something, it's like something's happened. Now I know this is called dissociation. It's actually a, a when you have long-term anxiety, you can dissociate. So things don't you don't feel quite part of the planet but um i was in a right mess and i i stopped working and i i luckily i found somebody and unfortunately they've passed away now but i found somebody that was doing the job that i do now and i went to see him and he sat me down and he started to share knowledge with me of what was happening and the thoughts that create these fears that create the panic. And I healed and recovered. It's only then I started to do some self-reflection and I thought I loved what he did. I And I also realized that I was a very vulnerable human being, whereas before I was a Superman, There's, there was no spots on me. I was very, very um, busy. I was very effective at what I did. I was a successful individual. And I became like this jelly 
a mm. very vulnerable person. And so I went back to see him in a respectful way to thank him. But I, I also had an ulterior motive. And I said to him, you know, I love what you did and I loved what you taught me. And I'd love to do what you do. And he smiled. I mean, this man, this man it was in his 80s. And he looked at me and he said, you can. He, you, you can learn if you really want to. And I said, I really want to. I, I, I kind of sort of, I felt like I was in, I had golden handcuffs, I call it. I, the, the job I was in was, it had very good incentives and, you know, good salary, et cetera. But my passion wasn't there. And I'd found something that I, I could felt that I could get my teeth into. I could really do some good in the world. So he guided me and steered me and I, I went back to university and I studied for four years. And to, I'll be fair with you, when they were teaching me all about the mind and the way we think, there were times I, I kept thinking, oh my God, I think the way they're teaching me to help people, a lot of the things that I think are the very things that they're saying people will come and see you to, <laughs> so you can help them. And I remember being at the back of the class thinking, oh dear, am I going to be able to do this? Because I feel like this is all about me. Uh, but what happened is I learned so much. And then I started to uh, help people at the weekends. And I was doing my, my other job. But then those people at the weekends went and told other people. And so people kept calling me and said, oh, you helped my friend and you did this and you did this and uh, they've improved. And before you knew it, I wasn't able to go to my normal job because there was too much work on the other side uh, in the work, in the coaching work I was doing and the hypnosis and all the other things that I do. And that gave me the opportunity to uh, say, you know, it's time to make that shift and do this full time. And at, and at about the same time, um, one day I woke up and I was in every single newspaper in the world. It started with every single newspaper in my country. I walked out into the high street and I, to get a sandwich and they said, you're in all the newspapers. And, <laughs> uh, and then that, I, I thank Richard Murdoch, I think, really, the, uh, the media baron. But he, he syndicated it out to the world and uh, about some of the work i'd done and then you know people like abc news were contacting me the bbc and they wanted to know you know what i was doing and you know some of the things i was helping people with and uh, the rest you can say is history and it's still happening to this day people are contacting hmm. me globally thanks to like zoom even now you know yeah. i'm working internationally with people all over the world um with anxiety states different different things yeah. usually very very particular things that you know that they've tried other places and they've tried other techniques and they just haven't been able to uh make change and uh i mean as they point out they say you're like my last hope sometimes i hear that too often okay. <laughs> you're, you're my last hope <laughs> no pressure there then no, you know, no, but, not uh, at all. you know so how long yeah. how long ago did you how long ago did you uh make this sleep of faith i mean no it was a reason it was a reason uh jump for from you that you realized that that the help that you had from that doctor uh from that uh therapist that they you the old uh, yeah. man uh and how long ago was it well it's just under 35 years ago now yeah. i'm 62 yeah. Yeah. Uh, 35 years ago but I do remember I, I remember uh, when I was 14 I was very strange I think I, instead of being into motorbikes I did read a book called self-hypnosis and it just grabbed me and I was a little boy really and uh, I had a very good friend at boarding school and we used to hypnotize each other and <clears throat> but not with no therapeutic uh, application it was just putting ourselves into trance and coming out. And we, we, we mastered this at a very young age. 
And then I, you know, a couple of years later, I just forgot about it. Um, girls came along. And so I got distracted <laughs> and put the books down. But uh, I, I just had this interest in the mind and uh, what the power of what you can do if you know the rules and, and how to uh, apply it in a, in a positive way. So I, I, I dip my, my toes in the water, so to speak, um, at 14, but formal training uh, was 35 years ago. Yeah, it's, it's curious, like you, when you had your panic attack for the first time, you didn't have any tools to face it. Face it, it was like, you know, out of the blue, something that you would put in expect, a young and brilliant career, you're traveling and everything, and all of a sudden you have something like this. Now you find yourself helpless. And all yeah. of a sudden you decide to go into studying, knowledge, preparation, and fix yeah. yourself, but all, not only that. Then it's like, I yeah. like this because now, uh, probably before for your passion, your purpose that you had since a kid, since you were a kid of, mm -hmm. you know, working with this concept and with this, uh, with this uh, sensible material. I mean, it's, uh, it's really something yeah. very, very delicate, you know, but still, yeah. still more about the panic attack. Uh, you didn't recognize the symptoms. That's, that's what happened to you. You, you were like, I'm dying here. And uh, you know, when you're getting uh, attacked with the machinery that is going to give you the electric shock, normally you are not awake. Okay. So if you see somebody doing like this, it means that it's not that one. Okay. I'm telling you because well, when, when, <laughs> when you lost when consciousness, in... then they're going to do it. So they don't do it when you are awake. Okay. You have a very valid point. <laughs> okay. And so it's like, okay. Now you, now you pointed that out. <laughs> I suppose on reflection, you're totally correct. Um, but at the time, um, when someone is fearing for their life, they go into this, um, well, everyone's heard about it. So many people have heard of the phrase, the fight or flight response, but yeah. most of the people don't really understand exactly what it is. But when you're in the fight or flight response, and if I get a chance, I'll, I'll expand on what it is uh, later. But when you're in that state, you're having so many different thoughts and the chemicals that are released while you're in that state are so powerful that they overwhelm you and so you're not thinking straight anyway so i, I would have you know, well maybe i wouldn't maybe i maybe i'm glad i didn't realize that hang on i'm i'm conscious therefore they're not going to use the pads on me um, because if i hadn't have gone through that journey I don't think I'd be here talking to you. So yeah. things worked out for the better. It was all good in a way that the whole experience, but um, no, you, you, it's so overwhelming. You just think you're, you just think something really bad's going to happen and you're going to die. Um, not everyone that has a panic attack actually uh, uh, thinks that that was just connected because my heart was racing. So some people, uh, they think they're going to faint because one of the one of the things that happens in a panic attack, the body prepares uh, you to run because our, our primitive ancestors would uh, go into fight or flight response when they're in danger. So the first thing to do is to run away from the danger or to stand and fight. So you need a lot of oxygen to take the effort to run. So you have to... Um, get the oxygen into the uh, bloodstream and then into the legs and arms so you can make that uh, um, response happen so you, if there's a tiger on your tail so to speak you can go but the lungs are pumping automatically it's an autonomic response an unconscious response you're not doing it on purpose so your lungs that start to work really quickly now if you're not running what happens is you over oxygenate the brain and then you start to feel dizzy. Then you can have a thought that, oh, I feel dizzy, I'm about to faint. And some people have this fear that they're going to faint in a, in a mall or in a public area or at work, and they're going to wake up on the floor and everyone's going to be staring at them and judging them in a negative way. So that creates uh, fear. Other people, they feel they're losing control they're losing control of their thoughts or their body um, 
or they don't know what they're losing control of. They just feel out of control um, or they're going to die. Sometimes we feel that, are we going mad? Are we going, is this the beginning of insanity? Because what happens in the brain when we're in survival mode, we're in the fight or flight response, we, we have a lot of thoughts. We go from one thought to another, trying to find out what's going on. And these racing thoughts are overwhelming. Some people can't sleep at night. They have insomnia because they have racing thoughts. They go from one problem to another to another. Um, one of the thoughts when you can't sleep, for instance, is why can't I sleep? How come other people can sleep? Um, mm. I'll be I'll be exhausted in the morning. I won't be able to cope with my work, and that creates fear. And when we have fear, adrenaline is gifted to us to help us escape. So, which is not very useful if you if you're trying to sleep. The last thing you want is yeah. your body pumping with adrenaline because yeah. your eyes are going to be wide yeah. awake, and um, and and that's not conducive with sleep. So our thoughts are very much responsible, but we don't necessarily, like you pointed out, I didn't, I wasn't in a rational frame of mind. So I didn't work it out that um, actually I'm conscious, therefore they're not going to use the pads. That was the <laughs> last thing on my mind. I was, just, I was, I didn't know what, I thought something really bad was going to happen. So my body was full of adrenaline and cortisol. And, uh, but it, yeah, it, I mean, this is, in, in those days, I mean, obviously there was knowledge because of all the um, you know mental issues, mental health, and panic attack, it was known, but the narrative was not like now. I mean, we were chatting before about statistics and like modern statistics, and we can see, you know, an increase. Probably there was already uh, in the past, but it was just not coded or was not there was no awareness. What do you think? I mean, when well, you started, uh, it, it obviously grew grew to a point and now everybody can talk about panic attack and everybody will say my i think there was a state yeah. that went through. in the past well, it was like there's multiple answers there there's uh there's multiple questions in what you just said the, the first thing i'd say is that i've seen anxiety and panic attack is on the growth it's since covid there's an yeah. increase when i when I, I remember seeing statistics that um of one in eight will experience anxiety or panic attacks at some time in their life one in eight which is high and then later on 10 years later i saw statistics statistics that said that uh, that had increased so uh, half of us will experience uh, panic attacks or anxiety in our lifetime and since covid just the other day i was reading that one in three so it's definitely on the increase and i've got some ideas why that is happening i think that's the speed of life um where as technology gets faster uh we can't keep up with it because we still have the mind and body of our ancestors but nothing's changed but the technology that we're using has changed as i i, I we were talking before uh, the show started um uh, you know the idea when I was at boarding school I'd, I'd I'd take an hour to write a letter yeah and I'd walk down to the post office another hour and put a stamp on it and send it to my mother uh you know I, I I've had at least a hundred uh letters today mm -hmm. emails we call them now and they were sent instantly and they were instant responses so the world has totally speeded up now also the pressures that I've seen a lot more children experiencing panic attacks and anxiety. Why is that happening? And that is because there's a lot more pressure, you know, the social media comparing, you know, everyone has to be successful. There's a lot of pressure on young people and the choices that we, that we have nowadays um, are, are so wide yeah. that you know nothing simple anyway i used to have a pair of jeans uh when they wore out i'd go into the shop and ask for a pair of jeans and they'd throw me a pair of levi's or wranglers you know now there's all these different brands and then within them different styles and different you know designs and colors and 
you know, the, the world's just full and of You must choice. know which one is uh, is the one posted, the one for that occasion, the other, the one for for the post on Instagram. You know, like it's yeah. uh, it's all related to showing and uh, and compare, like you said. But um, yeah. uh, uh, just just a point from myself, you know, like being an aviator in the past, uh, yeah. mental health and uh, this kind of issues. I mean, like as a pilot, you go through training, you go through difficult and dangerous situations. And uh, we did we were not talking about this. It was like one of those taboo growing up as a military fighter pilot that no one was talking about. But for sure, people were. Because the narrative there was like, ah, you have, we are afraid, you have anxiety, you're not good for this. Okay. Nowadays, yeah. when you when you are a pilot, either a civilian or military pilot, there is much more attention to mental health. So the narrative has changed, probably because you know you're doing the same job that you were doing 20 years ago, flying an airplane, but still you are into an environment that has become much more complicated or not complicated, but complex, let's say. So at the point, mm -hmm. the inputs that you receive sometimes, uh, if you, if you never stop and reflect, uh, you probably are going too fast, as you said, and, uh, and something is going to happen. I mean, your, your, your brain is going to be, is going to max out at a certain point and, uh, and, and give a reaction. It could be a panic attack. It could be uh fatigue, tiredness, whatever, but, that's my 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 experience and my um let's say it, with the years i've changed my point of view you know like i was at the beginning i was seeing like my air force was saying these things oh look at this guy yeah he's afraid of flying no nowadays i can understand when people have issues with with, with the, you know relating to situations dangerous situations or with other people yeah, I, I, I think that we have moved on. I think a lot of people, a lot of famous people in uh, have gone on television um, and talked about their mental health, their depression, their anxiety, yeah. etc. They've normalized it, and so they should. Do I feel that we've reached that stage where you know, it's out there and accepting? No, there's still mm. a lot of stigma. Uh, people are ashamed of being human and having these problems they're, they're not rare these are these are common problems that people mm -hmm. are enduring and you know luckily yeah it, it, it it's a million miles from where, where where it's been where we used to sort of brush it under the carpet but it's still being brushed under the carpet and i think i, I was I, going back to your question about uh, panic attacks we know a lot more about it yeah the internet has has done that but i think a lot of people who have not experienced anxiety or panic attacks they don't they don't need to know about it because it's not affecting them yeah. and it's, it's a very internal problem because you can have someone experience panic attacks and everyone else in the family and i've seen this They'll be saying, come on, it's okay, just pull yourself yeah. together, you'll yeah. be fine. And that's not true. It's very difficult for someone receiving that sort of information from a loved one. Pull yourself together, you're going to be fine. Yeah. You get more sympathy from a broken arm than you do from anxiety and panic attacks. Yeah. And I'd rather have a broken arm. But yeah. people will see you with a broken arm, they're sympathetic. But because you can't see it, it's felt internally. And it's very powerful feelings and very scary. People uh, outside of uh, your family, they can't relate to it. And they should be forgiven for that. It's not their fault. No, no, you, no, no. I, I, had a, I had a doctor that come, came to see me a few years ago. And he, he, he was a lovely, lovely man. And he'd had a panic attack on an airplane. And he said... He said, I'll be really honest with you. He said, when people came to see me, because I'd never experienced it myself, when I prescribed the drugs, I couldn't really relate to the problem. I knew what drugs to, to, to give them, but I just didn't have any insight into how intense it was. And I smiled and I said, well, what about now? He said, no, I've changed my attitude completely yeah. to anyone that has. I'm much more empathetic with those people because I've now experienced it. And I, I think that 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 was one of the blessings that I had 
I don't think I could be as effective with the people that um, I help uh, if I hadn't endured the same, if I hadn't traveled the same path as them, because I know I've mapped the thoughts that people have that trigger anxiety and panic attacks. So when I talk about the thoughts that, and they hear, they're usually saying things like, I, that's how I think. And we have to rationalize, like, for instance, if someone's thinking, I'll give you some of the thoughts, for example, like, uh, I'm going to have a heart attack because the heart is racing fast, or I'm going to collapse or faint because they feel dizzy because they're hyperventilating, they're breathing so rapidly. And it happens sometimes, they don't notice, but they're over-oxygenating the brain and they feel dizzy, but they, they won't faint. If you faint when you've got a lack of oxygen, not too yeah. much, but you, but you will feel dizzy. Um, sometimes the throat tightens up uh, as it would with a runner to yeah. make the, you know, to allow the oxygen into their lungs more yeah. effectively. But it feels like there's a, a lump or a sensation of tightness like that. And they sometimes they mistake and I think, am I going to choke to death? The racing thoughts that happen, that's the survival instinct where we're jumping from one thought to another, trying to find a way out of these emotions that are internalized. Yeah. And these racing thoughts, we assume we're going mad. So um, another, another another one that should, what happens is when you when you go into fight or flight and you you have this tendency to want to escape, so you're getting prepared to run away. Um, you don't need to eat a burger when you're running away from a tiger, so to speak. So <laughs> what happens is our digestive system shuts down because it's not it's not required. And the blood that's in the digestive system is sent into the legs to help us to feed the, ox uh, the oxygen through the blood into our calf muscles so we can run faster. But what we experience is nausea and butterflies in our stomach when the blood's shutting down. Or if we're standing, we'll feel like we call it jelly leg, um, but our legs feel very heavy. And that all these feelings start to worry us. So we start to fear the feelings as well. Um, and then we think maybe I'm going to lose control and I'm going to do something embarrassing. And people, the public, if I'm in the mall, for, or for instance, or at work, they're going to judge me badly for acting out that way. All these things that they're thinking don't happen. Uh, but they don't rationalize. They don't think, oh, well, these things never happen. They just think, maybe it was building up and I got away with it this time, but maybe it will happen tomorrow or the next time I have a panic attack. So they're feeding into their anxiety. And this is why it can carry on for months, yeah. ye years. And I hate to say, but decades sometimes because mm. they they don't challenge the thoughts and people aren't showing them how to do that. Tools of the Humans. This is your contemporary podcast where you will learn how humans face challenges. Everybody has a story to tell. Listening is knowledge. Let us know if you're interested in sharing your story or if you know somebody who wants to tell theirs. The show is available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts and YouTube. I have two questions for you. Uh, the first one, you know, it, it starts from a from a thought. It starts from something that is uh, uh, not real. Let's say it's in our brain, but it's not manifested, and it becomes manifested with the symptoms. No, so the yeah. first question is uh, symptoms versus root cause. What is your strategy uh, to? Uh, to attack these two things, you know, because they, we, we know the doctor are going to give you some pills to attack the symptoms, but there is a yep. root cause and then you need to research and you do. So that, that's your job, basically. The second yep. question is, is, has it ever happened to you to have a client that was having a, a panic attack in the moment that you were seeing the, 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 the client and you were able to 
collect and right away give back a tool to fix it and to uh, to get out of that yeah. situation yeah 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 and, and not just on occasion quite often um people will have an anxiety or a, a panic attack and oh that in, in fact that's really useful in a way it's uh, yeah <laughs> it's 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 a gift because when i'm with them i i what i usually do is they they they'll you'll see them there they'll go pale and they'll stop talking because in fight or flight the, the left side of the brain shuts down and language and logic is held in the left side of the brain so they'll usually go silent and they'll start to hyperventilate now my job when that's happening is to bring them out of their thoughts so i'll just usually just say hey come out of your mind for a minute i'll use a grounding technique so uh what i'll do is i'll say just focus on me for a minute and sometimes they, they find that difficult because they're trying to deal with the the feelings they're trying to they're trying to suppress the feelings and control them and instead what i do is like okay give me five things in the room that are green and they're like, what? And they're confused. Uh, five things. Look at me. Focus on me. Don't focus on your feelings. Five things in the room that are green. And they're like, uh, the plant, uh, your book, and a few other things. Okay, okay. Four things you, you can feel on your body right now. And they're like, feel. I said, yeah. Like, can you feel your shirt, mm. the, your spectacles? your tongue in your mouth and then you can see them start to externalize is off. yeah yeah is off. i go okay what else can you feel um my shoes uh okay what about the seat you're sitting in yeah yeah i can i can actually i can feel my watch i say okay give me three things that you can hear right now the air conditioning unit there's a creaking in the building your voice yeah. two things that you can smell and they're like smell oh well, yeah just smell your shirt you might have some washing powder or your aftershave one thing you can taste i go how do you feel right now and they go uh better mm -hmm. and they're like what did you what did, what did you do i said i didn't do anything you did it all yeah. i did was stopped you catastrophizing and focusing on the feelings and brought you out into the present moment touch the table how does it feel it feels cold well if you're either inside your head catastrophizing or yeah. you're outside experiencing and that's just a very simple technique it's not um uh you know magic it, it's just a technique to bring them out and that's just one of many techniques and they they can use that and they do use that as part of the tools that I give them to get back into the world because someone I can go for a walk in the park in fact I did yesterday and I stood under a flame tree which I don't know if you've seen a flame tree but beautiful red leaves mm -hmm. and I took some pictures of it and while I was doing that I noticed there's some birds two birds and they were singing and I, was, I wanted to know who they were singing to now, when I had anxiety and um, and was experienced panic attacks, when I walked through a park, I didn't see anything like that. Mm -hmm. I was deep in thought of, will I ever recover? Will I ever get over this? Why me? Have they misdiagnosed me at the doctors? Did they maybe miss something? Should I go to another doctor and get a second opinion? So... I was deep in thought, jumping from one worry to another, which creates fear. So I was fueling the anxiety. And when that continued, I would then eventually scare myself and I'd get a panic attack. So externalizing, teaching people. And you have to reteach people to externalize, to get back out into the real world. Uh, and also at the same time, to show them how to let go of thoughts because thoughts will come and go but what happens is we can get into um a tug of war with our thoughts we can have thoughts about thoughts what we call cognitive consequences mm -hmm. so you can have like you know 
<clears throat> uh, I hope I don't get this feeling. If I, if I get this feeling, how will I cope? Uh, why me, poor me? Um, am I am I going crazy or you know whatever? So we can have lots and lots of thoughts, it's like being a tug of war with ourselves. But we don't have to do that. Mm. We don't we we can be taught how to let go of those thoughts and become present centered, and uh, that's part just one piece of the jigsaw puzzle of um, curing anxiety and, and, and panic. Mm -hmm. that's a great uh, ability so useful to to be able to read it's not reading minds but it's reading you know all the bits and pieces which after 35 years of experience obviously it's much easier than if, if i start tomorrow okay but yeah, you've, been, yeah. you've been exposed to many situations and that that you have developed this kind of database because well, I think so you know everybody is externalizing their symptoms. I mean, like the, probably the common common uh, symptoms, let's say. But uh, each individual is different. So that idea that is making this uh, this panic attack is different from everybody. And uh, even if it's a fear, it could be a fear for of, of a bird. It could be a fear of falling. It could be a fear of uh, you know flying. So there are many many things that then yeah you would recognize the symptoms, but then you need to go to the root cause. And now uh, how to fix it is it's, it's a matter of experience and a matter of studying the the human mind and the human uh, behavior as you, as you said you are, you, are, you are a behavioralist so <laughs> the, I think I couldn't even spell it before but uh, now I have Google it and then I, could, I could find well it. what happens is just like you as a pilot I mean I, you wouldn't put me in an airplane and ask me to fly a plane because it wouldn't be up there for very long but as a pilot you're doing things intuitively because you've got many 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 hours years of practice and your competencies are there built in automatically with when when you spent so long with people uh who are experiencing uh panic attacks anxiety they there is only so many thoughts they will hold anyone uh, watching this who's experiencing panic or anxiety will totally relate to the common thoughts that we have and you don't necessarily have all the thoughts because some people they don't have a problem with their heart racing they don't they don't focus on that they're more focus they're focusing on other things like fainting um so you don't necessarily have all the thoughts but some some people do they say, they'll say i think all of those things i'm gonna have a heart attack i'm gonna lose control i'm gonna go mad uh others they'll say no i don't i don't think any of those but i feel like i'm gonna vomit mm -hmm. uh, i always feel like i'm gonna be sick um so but usually it's it, it's one of eight or nine um particular common thoughts which will trigger their panic attack or anxiety and so you map it you 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 just through the years you've heard people tell you and you we've been able to map those thoughts and also the physical symptoms you know there there's about 14 physical symptoms that people have mm. when they have a panic attack like they'll have tingling sometimes uh palpitations uh shortness of breath feel like they're choking i think i've gone through a few of these feeling feeling like they, they want to go to the toilet in a hurry mm. because um which is really useful if you're being chased by a tiger if you defecate um i don't want to go into too much detail about that but that can save your life if you were you know for our ancestors running to the jungle if you defecated it might actually distract the animal but when we're frightened we can feel like we're going to toilet ourselves or we need to go to the toilet in a hurry and some people um have a fear of toileting when they're out and they get they, they really they can have a panic attack when stuck in traffic would you believe yeah. they fear that they might get into a traffic jam and then that fear creates the anxiety in the body and then their body starts to uh work too quickly the enteric nervous system that steers our food through the gut works very quickly and we want to defecate and we sometimes 
have clients who fear that they're going to the toilet. So they'll go home, uh, sorry, they'll leave home in the morning and then go, oh, I'll just go to the toilet or they, wherever they're going out, they have to map where the toilets are because they have this fear. <laughs> um, and it can really uh, intrude on their lifestyle. You know, they, they worry about this constantly. Uh, and that's, you know, that's a very common problem. Mm. But do we hear about it? No, because most of the people that have these problems, they think they're the only one and yeah. they think they're on their own and they're ashamed and they, they're embarrassed and they don't want to share it, um, you know, w- w- with people. It's a very private thing. So um, we don't we don't get to hear about this stuff. I do. I yeah. see every day. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it's... much more than before. Obviously, mental health. Let's not call it mental illness, but mental health. It's a, yeah. it's a, it's a narrative that we hear so many times on the radios and media and everything. So yeah, we need to, you know, send away this stigma. You know, the stigma, 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 which is depression, anxiety, panic attacks, and, and but. It, it's is it common that people give up on panic attack to become at a certain point the big panic attack becomes a part of their of their of their life a chronic condition they and they're dealing with it you know like until until the day of their death yeah uh, yes yeah. yeah yeah because if somebody thinks for instance i'm not fixable there's no hope for me i'm always going to be this way there's no opportunity i've tried everything um what's the point point? and the people think like that and so they they learn they learn to live with it and that's sad that's really sad hmm. and, and it's frustrating to, to hear and but understandable so people do they do try things sometimes or they 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 try an approach that doesn't work for them Mm -hmm. i've seen people i i work with people that have gone to somebody who's quite competent and good at what they do but they weren't ready to change Mm -hmm. so as i often share with the people that come and see me it's i'm not a miracle worker um Mm -hmm you do have to apply what i teach and if you don't and you stay with the same thoughts then nothing's going to change yeah so sometimes i'll I'll work with someone and i get a great result and yet they've tried something before and it didn't work now was that the practitioner was that the person or is uh, or is it the client that's coming in and they're ready for change does that make sense? Yeah, 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 yeah sure, sure. So, so, yeah, there are people that will just feel like there there is no hope. And then if someone feels like there's no hope and they give up on themselves, then they, they're probably not going to be in the right frame of mind to, uh, to, to apply the things they're taught because they're not going to work for them anyway. But the, but you don't give up on those people. I, mm. I can be I can be quite persuasive, and I think that's that's one of my uh, yeah. skill sets. So yeah. someone once said that I should should have been a barrister. Okay. Um, it's like, and, and and I think I think when you're working with clients, you are going to courts, and what happens is I'm going to use the analogy of the courtroom here that people that have problems with their thoughts that cause these feelings they they go into court in their mind and the the judge is them but the jury is also them mm, yeah. and the prosecution is them but there's no defense so if you go to the court with just prosecution, a judge and a jury, you're just going to slam yeah. the hammer down and go guilty. Yeah. So guilty. if they guilty, think yes. that I'm going to have a heart attack and this yeah. is the onset, these, these, these feelings are the onset of a heart attack and you don't have a rational argument. So well, hang on a minute. Did you not know it was um, adrenaline that's creating the, um, the rapid heart rate and your thoughts that are causing that and show them how to change those thoughts, those unhealthy beliefs, then they're going to be in a courtroom all, all day with a, just the prosecutor and he's going to win or she's going to win. 
Um, my job is to get into that courtroom and start to show and uh, the jury, judge and the prosecution that actually their, their thoughts are irrational and they're not true. And so you do have to be uh, persuasive at times and, and present arguments and logic um, within the um, sessions um, in different ways. It's like chipping away. Yeah, marble, you have to find an angle to, to get in, yeah. Yeah, totally, totally. Mm. And uh, that is a skill set that I think is required. Um, and I, I, I think that has a lot to do with the results that I get is, um, mm. you know, you've got to be passionate. You've got to be, you've got to have an answer for everything that is being mm. asked mm -hmm. of you. Because if you don't have an answer and it has to be real, it has to be truthful, then they will think, oh, no, you didn't know, you didn't know the answer to that. Though. So mm -hmm. they'll just stick with their original, their original belief. Yeah. So yeah, you have to be honest. I mean, like, on you probably met people with this chronic condition, you know, and they were, they, they, they were dealing for the entire life with panic attacks. And, but what is Russell's word of the of wisdom? for them why shouldn't people give up on fighting and getting out of the situation i mean much more holistic approach and say i'm not talking about the tools and everything but why you know if somebody's suffering from panic attack now and is listening is like why wouldn't wouldn't give up wouldn't sh why shouldn't people give up on uh, on on trying to fix this situation that's a great question and it's it's not one that uh, I haven't answered <laughs> because, and I'll, I'll tell you straight, you only get one life, as far as I know. And the quality of that life is down to ourselves. It's not the events in our life that affect us. It's the thoughts that we hold about those events. And the quality of our life is our health, as well as our, you know, our physical health and our mental health is very important it carries us through life and we're all entitled to the best quality life that we've ever had and just because you haven't been able to overcome your anxiety and panic uh in the past doesn't mean you can't uh change in the future and you owe it you owe it to yourself and the people that you love and care about to give yourself the best quality of life that you you could ever offer yourself and that is why they should never give up. And that's why they should seek out um, and be open-minded to get assistance with their problems. And uh, don't be ashamed because you're not alone. As I said, you know, half the population are going to experience anxiety. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just, it's more common than not now. Yeah, so yeah, it, it is, purely, it is. purely over, they yeah. owe it to themselves. Yeah. And I, I just, I remember, I, you know, I remember thinking that I'll always have this problem. And I'm not ashamed, I'm not ashamed. I became depressed thinking, why me, poor me? Will I ever recover? Yeah. Mm. And if I'm not going to recover, what? what will life be like and i didn't feel like living yeah. i felt like giving up now since that time when i recovered and i i got the right approaches and i put them into practice i reflect on i've had some beautiful experiences mm. i haven't been back to canada yet i keep promising myself <laughs> <laughs> i've got to get back to whistler and actually yeah. see it for what it is because i didn't see it uh only from a the view of an ambulance yeah, and stretcher but i've got to get back there but no i've had some wonderful experiences and i've met some wonderful people uh but there was a time that i was in that place that that dark place where i didn't feel like i, I wanted to be here but that is temporary and just you know that is temporary it doesn't matter if you're in your 30s 40s 50s or you're, you're 90 years of age things can change my mother had anxiety and panic attacks uh for most of my childhood um unfortunately she passed away two years ago with covid but what happened her quality of life uh, she didn't have those panic attacks and anxiety later in life and things changed and we can all change 
we every single one of us we're not stuck we're we're not you know clay pots we are plastic we are flexible and we just need to get the right information in the right way uh to and help to facilitate this change and that's possible i've seen it i, I, I was speaking to a lady in abu dhabi today who i worked with and uh, she had anxiety and panic attacks for years um in fact i'll, I'll try uh, she did say that she'd be comfortable to share it she didn't want to go oh nice you know, yeah, yeah but I'll, I'll i'll talk to her about that but um you know it's, it's been like she couldn't go in malls she she would have mm -hmm. panic attacks in malls yeah and, and, uh, and in the middle east where you know most of the activities are done indoor and malls it's a it's a big limiter eh? it looks like you know, if you think about, well, I live in Europe, you know, in the in the greens, yes, but in the Middle East, you're living indoor, you know, for yeah. most uh, most part of the year. So that that's a big thing. Um, she hated queuing in um, shopping malls because if she had a panic attack in the queue with her food yeah. on the on the uh, conveyor belt, she couldn't leave it, and so okay. she had this. The idea is, I want to run home to safety, so she would have the panic attacks always when she was in a queue, which is funny enough where I used to get them as well. <laughs> It's yeah. uh, it's very common uh, that is so uh, mm, so common. Huh? No, I, I really love the the way that you you thought you, you talked about mapping and recording humans, you know, and uh, using your tools. And uh, quick one: what is the interlinear source that people present to you when they come to you for a he for help? That moment there is something triggering them. So they have a tool that they're using in the moment. And what is it? What happens when they are empty, but still they're coming to you and they're looking for help? Nowadays, um, I came to the Middle East 12 years ago. And so everyone was new. What happened was, as the years went on, people that I'd helped started to share with their friends or relatives their experience. And so the people that um, were able to make those changes, they talk. And so mm -hmm. most of the people that come and see me these days are friends of friends or family members that are going through difficult times. And they've been referred uh, to me uh, based on what they've they've seen you know it's very common it's like my sister came to you and you helped her or my brother or a family member or a friend at work um so it, it's really it's it, it, is it a village it's a village yeah, and yeah. People, you know they, they discuss these things especially when they've recovered there's nothing better than someone's recovered from something. They don't mind talking about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I when you recover, like you're a superhero, I right? I used to yeah, feel yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I think that, I think there's some when people overcome a problem like this, I think it's to their betterment. They, I think we become better people yeah. when we go through something difficult like anxiety and come out yeah. the other end. I yeah, it, I think so. It humanizes us. It makes us realize yeah. that we're not superhuman, and and the pace of life that we we've, you know, that we've involved ourselves in. We we you can't just keep continuing to just give 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 all the time, and you yeah. know, spend hours, you know, on technology, and that. You you need quality sleep, you need quality food, you need quality <laughs> thoughts, or else there's consequences. So, yeah. uh, is. That that's really really important to get those you know those three things it, right. It looks like people are lowering their threshold of shame with the people that they know. It looks like people are feeling much more comfortable with people that they know to share their their situation. And now their threshold of shame is lower. So now I'm exposing myself, and the, the other guy that that the new that they been there already is able to to provide advice, and they are receptive, but. The, 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 it's, still, it's still a stigma because if you think about it, you know, the, as you said, it's a village. So it's still uh, underground there and, and people that are not able to lower their threshold, they're still stuck in, uh, in, uh, in the situation, in, uh, in the stigma, no? So, I mean, it, social media is helping 
or is a is a curse in both ways you know because you can use it, it, it you can use it to uh make people more uh, aware but you can use it also to to make people more scared and uh and then finally comparison <laughs> Okay. I'm, I'm be, smiling. I'm smiling because be the banned. amount of people that research a problem, you know, if you get a headache and they go on the internet, it's a brain. Yeah. Uh, you know, and so there's so much information. And depending on how you phrase it when you yeah. put it in, uh, into Google, the information changes. You know, is sugar good for you? Uh, sugar's good for you, isn't it? And then suddenly all the good things that sugar is good for you, you know, yeah. comes up. So too much information is not a good thing always because mm. I, 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 it happened to me. I used to read, I was getting medical books out and think, you know, look up and say, oh, these, these are some of the symptoms I've got. And then I catastrophe, oh, my God, I could be dying. And that was 35 years ago. I didn't die. <laughs> but, but we can scare ourselves with too much information. Mm. Uh, so it's a good thing and, it, and it's a bad thing um people sometimes uh, not people don't come in to see me purely for this but some some people are very strong on certainty they must be certain yeah that their health is okay and they will visit doctors regularly for checkups and to, you know uh, every lump becomes cancer or whatever mm, so yeah. people there's some people that really demand certainty and they'll research on the internet and they'll they'll worry themselves and they get anxiety about what they think they've got. Mm. And then they, the doctor says, no, nothing wrong with you, it's fine. <laughs> uh, and then they'll go and find something else and it, so it goes on. So yeah, there's a thought, there is a thought that drives anxiety about certainty as well. I must be certain that I am well, you know? Mm. So, um, yeah, information is, can be dangerous. I, can I'd be dangerous, yeah. Be, yeah. But it's also useful, you know? Um, there's a lot of good stuff out there as well. You just got to know. You got to know where to look and uh, the right places, and to dismiss a lot of the stuff that's out there. It's uh, it's a minefield. Yeah, I think uh, this is a great uh, knowledge place today with your uh, words and your uh, sharing. Uh, really good mapping and decoding human uh, human brain and <laughs> human mind and uh, and the thoughts um to avoid becoming uh chronic uh, panic attack uh uh Sufferer. maniac <laughs> okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well. so we don't want anybody to be like this you know we, we want people to to live their lives to enjoy their lives and uh to have meaning 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 meaningful lives you know and doesn't have to be always happy because uh, it, it happiness kind of temporary that's the that's what you find I in literature that. happiness so, but being meaningful, if you lose meaning in life because you have a condition that you're not able to, um, to face by yourself, your tools are not enough. There are tools around and, and you are the expert on this. Um, we're going to talk again about panic attack for sure in the next episode. So we're going to try to get some case studies in the, in the next episode. But for today, I think we, we covered uh, what well, we agreed, okay? And we didn't digress too much, so that's okay. <laughs> okay. That's true. That's true. Yeah. We stay tuned for, for the next episode, okay? Okay. Thank you very much, Russell. Uh, this is Tools of the Humans. See you next time. <laughs>